Hello, you're very welcome along to this week's edition of The Group Chat. I am news correspondent Richard Chambers. I am joined beside me by political correspondent Gavin Riley. Richard, how are you? And fellow news correspondent Zara King. Hello, how are you? Good, how are you keeping, guys? Yeah, good, actually, actually. not too bad, yeah. We are joined in the studio the other week by Alina Kalmakova uh, from Ukraine. There's been a lot of talk about Ukrainian refugees over the last while. A lot of talk about Ukrainians, but not a lot of talk with Ukrainians, I think, in the media. Is that something you've noticed yourself, do you think? Uh, I think yes, sometimes happens. It, yeah. And it happened to me, I've been interviewed already, so I'm glad to be here today in this studio. Well, we're so delighted you came in, aren't we? We're thrilled. Okay. Like, thank you so much for making the journey out. I thank suppose. you for inviting. Yeah, no, definitely. And this isn't your first interview thing. You've done a couple before. Uh, I've done a couple before yeah. and uh, all of them were published also over the media. Like, uh, But this one is first on the TV, I think. Well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we're honoured to have you we for your first TV <laughs> slot. First TV appearance. Yeah. Alina, yeah. take us back to, to what happened in your life from February 24th. What happened in your life? How did it change from that date? Insane, because previously I lived a totally good life. I was absolutely satisfied and I was traveling a lot. And actually, I came back to Ukraine after traveling to Portugal, then to Italy. And I found out there is uh, something being happened in country which I wasn't thinking about and I wasn't ready. Um, then I had to flee in from war and uh, I was fleeing from war actually the 1st of March. Uh, then escaped to Budapest, stayed there uh, about two weeks and then moved to Ireland. And actually it wasn't, incre it wasn't incredible because uh, I haven't thought about it. I could never imagine I would be traveling to Ireland because it was the only one uh, country opened to Ukrainians uh, who are English speaking. Mm. So I understood there was um, the only one um, good country because um, I had already English experience uh, in English, um, working, working with English because I was engaged in the different international projects. So I thought that would be nice. And I have never been there before. And um, most of the people, they told me it would be a very nice country. You would like it. Nice. So, Can you tell us about that process from when you left your home in Kyiv, isn't it? Kiev, yeah. When you left there and you, how did you find that process of getting across Europe? Because that's been quite difficult for a lot of people. What was it like for you? Uh, first by foot, then uh, paying crazy amount of money for taxi with uh, crossing the border because it wasn't impossible to cross by foot. Uh, it was huge lines of people staying there and waiting to be uh, invited to, uh, to other countries. Um, then Hungary, Hungary wasn't that special. They were trying to help and locals were engaged, but no one could understand what was happened. So for me, it was totally insane. Uh, I would say, uh, I would say honestly, I was almost sleeping two weeks staying there, but I found a job. Uh, then I found out it was impossible to stay for a long time because uh, anyways, uh, I have to learn local language, which is not that simple. Hungarian is a difficult language. It's, yeah, it's a bit of a, much. yeah, it's a quirky yeah, it's one. Difficult. Yeah. yeah, it's difficult. So this, this why, this why it happened. Ireland happened to me. So after two weeks then in Hungary, you decide that Ireland is where you want to come and you've already heard that Ireland is open to, to people from your country, yeah, especially with the language. Yeah. Um, how did you find it getting here? And then where did you end up sleeping for the first while that you were here? Oh, I ended up sleeping uh, in a gym. I was accommodated in a gym because uh, it was uh, St. Patrick's Day and we were lack of hotels accommodation. Mm. And uh, then uh, later, one of my friends, because I was fleeing from war with my neighbor, who I saw the first time in my life, she was a uh, sister of my designers at my work. And uh, she asked to pick up her sister too. So we decided to flee together because it would be much more easier for two girls traveling together. You mentioned the gym for the first couple of nights. So what was that? What was that like? Was that sort of like camp beds and it's sort of on a gym uh, floor? What was not Ukrainians only were yeah. still in there. Also some people from Nigeria and Morocco, maybe, I don't know, different countries. And um, all the locals were very friendly towards us. They were trying to help. Uh, if one of those ladies even brought me pajama because I was asking for I had no I had no nothing to yeah. choose. Yeah. And she brought her own pajama and you won from Primark. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, lovely, that, yeah. That was That's lovely. Fine, that was yeah. really lovely. Yeah. So all of them were acting very friendly. They were very supportive. But um, this is not conditions of staying. People really have to stay in. It's abnormal, I think. But that's what a lot of people now are. That's yeah. the situation now is it's mm. become worse yeah. over the last they number can... of weeks. So that's actually become quite normal for a lot of people is to be in that sort of camp beds on a gym floor sort of situation at this point. I think they have no other choice because uh, most of them, they don't speak any any languages except very uh, small English, mm. Mm. very poor English. So that's why they choose Ireland. And also there was a massive power campaign about Ireland. Massive. That's why. 
that is the issue. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because sometimes we, we in Ireland don't realise how much communications there's been outside of the country to make people aware that Ireland is open and available to people from your country. So how early did you find out or how early do people from Ukraine find out that Ireland is willing to take them and that there aren't any visa requirements? Uh, mostly on the Facebook because there are so many uh, Facebook groups for Ukrainians uh, traveling somewhere and fleeing from war and also over the internet because um, Irish government, they put so many messages over the internet also and on the official sites also. They, uh, that they're, they are already hosting Ukrainians and they are welcoming Ukrainians. But is there any clarity in those messages about the type of accommodation that people can expect? Is there any sort of indication of what is a reasonable expectation when you come to Ireland or is it just a case of come to Ireland and, and worry uh, about that later? I got it. Uh, first, it was reasonable expectations because uh, they told they would provide some hotels accommodation, mm -hmm. but none of them were provided. And also uh, individuals like me, they were not provided because I was uh, the only one person. I was alone yeah. uh, fleeing from war because my family stays in Ukraine still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who's, so, yeah. at, who's at home? Who's, who's uh, my mom and my grandma. Grandma, because it's impossible to move for them somewhere. And how are they? So so, because uh, yeah. Kiev uh, feels like absolutely not not that empty, but uh, people living in the dark. Yeah, that's something I suppose people might have seen that over the headlines for the last while that power has become scarcer in Kiev mm -hmm. and, and other cities like that because of attacks on infrastructure. I mean, for a while it seemed like Kiev was escaping. You know, it had a quiet number of months, if you could even put it like that. But over the last couple of weeks, it's definitely gotten, you know, more and more into the fire. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I know I, I know some friends of mine uh, who were traveling to Ireland and they were about settling here because of kids and because of tough conditions of living in Ukraine also. And they even had some money and they were trying to find an accommodation for a crazy amount of money. For example, one room costs uh, 100, 1,300 euros in Klondalkin, just one room. So, no, the prices are, are incredible. incredible. Do you get yeah. a chance to talk to your mom and your grandmother often? Do you uh, often, yeah, yeah, yeah. Often. Now they have some issues with internet connections. Yeah. But... Um, um, most but is that a constant do. worry for you, even as you try to establish a life here, that you are constantly worrying about those you've left? I'm constantly home? worrying about them. Yeah. yeah, because no one knows what can happen uh, in a few seconds. Was there ever any time for the, the few months where things seemed to be quiet, relatively quiet in Kiev, where, where the battle seemed to, to leave the capital and, and until a few weeks ago when it came back? Was there ever a time where you sort of felt tempted or that you might have felt it was ever safe or comfortable to go back and to be with your, your mother and your grandmother? I didn't uh, even visit Kiev. Mm. It's mm. been almost eight months, seven and a half as I'm staying here. And uh, I never visit, visit the Ukraine. Because sometimes people from Ireland, that would, they would have perceived if they've been following it on the news, but they would have seen a few months go by without there being any mention of any attacks on the capital. So many people might think, well, if it was safe, for example, for the Irish embassy to reopen and for the Irish staff there to go back and to live on the ground and to work there, they would wonder whether it was safe for, for people like you to, to go back to, to home effectively. Well, I have some friends who were, uh, who were about... Um who were thinking about uh, traveling back home and some of them even traveled and they are trying to settle again and now what what I see they're messaging me like we are traveling to Portugal we are traveling to Poland we are going to United States we are going to Canada because it's not safe it's not safe and um, the conditions of living are tough I think that's something which I think it's important to sort of stress is that this is anything about your old life becomes completely flipped upside down. And I think that's for, you know, we have that conversation about, well, when will people think about going home? But like their country and their homes will never be the same again. Is that something that you think about as well? I think that is an issue also because they will they will travel to uh, their native cities and then they will find out there is no more Ukraine or Ukraine is totally different. It's It's, it's a different country. And people are different because of mindset. Mindset has changed. Mm. Could you tell us a little bit more about your own life before you left and before the war started? Uh, I mean, you, you're, you're living in Kiev. You, you told us a little bit about that you have your, your mother and your grandmother there. But what, what is life like? Because, I mean, w people who might not follow the news that closely will hear of Ukraine. They'll hear of Kiev, but they won't know much about it. They won't know much about what the city is like. Like, I think from people you do hear about Kiev and they talk about such a vibrant city mm -hmm. and a really buzzing sort of culture. I mean, what is Kiev like? What was your life like before you came here? Um, my life was amazing. I was working in... Uh, as um, uh, as a public relations director for investment company and for several uh, different projects, I was totally engaged into social life. I was socializing all the time. I was traveling all the time somewhere. And <clears throat> for me, it was like, uh, I wouldn't say super high end, but it was good. 
really good. Mm. So uh, I had interest in circles for communications like diplomacy circles. As actually, I have the same circles here also. That's why I like Ireland also. <laughs> but um, we had uh, good conditions of living because we have now the type of accommodation crisis. Um, we can buy something for us. Yeah, yeah, prices sometimes are different. They are not mm. that huge as here. But we can uh, we can pay for accommodation. Uh, we can uh, pay... Here it would be uh, told as a mortgage. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. At what so point this, in arrange. in the last eight months has it become clear to you that that sort of life and that sort of sort of lifestyle is unlikely to ever come back? Because I guess maybe for the first couple of weeks you wonder how long war might be going on for. You don't know how long you might have to leave the country for. You don't know what state the country will be in when you decide to go back. I'm guessing at some point in the last eight months you've realised that if you ever did go back, things would never be like they were. I don't know where am where am I in the nearest two weeks. Because we yeah. have, because yeah. even here, yes, I have someone who is uh, able to host me, and that's it. And but but housing problem is is a huge problem. I think the first one in in Ireland, and maybe I will travel to another country. Maybe many people staying here right now also will travel to another country. Who knows? And most likely, I'm unable to return home at least uh, nearest two years, and no one knows what is going to happen after, because there is a huge risk of. Uh, huge war. And when you look at the situation now and what Ireland is offering people now and I suppose the fact that maybe some people might say that um, there was very little notice about this running out that it was kind of flagged a week in advance does that upset you to see that like you know this could have been predicted that this shortage was coming for such a long time and that how do you feel the Irish government has handled the communications around all of that? Uh, they don't tell anything. They don't provide any information about it and even yet they haven't provided it. Mm. I think they should mention because there is huge accommodational crisis. We are, yes, we are welcoming you. We will provide you some work permissions and permissions to stay and live and that is absolutely fair and we really do appreciate that and we do really appreciate all that provided help but you have to say that there is a lack of accommodation there is shortage of building we don't um we don't provide a housing for local people mm. be honest yeah mm. how has you have you seen things change since you arrived here you arrived here on st patrick's day back in march how is do you think that the attitude and the the response of irish people towards ukraine and to people who have arrived here from ukraine have you noticed that change in any way well, people were very responsive, but I think uh, over the few months something has changed. And I think that's why Irish government provided that um, they doubled the fees. The, the, the pay payments, payment yes, for, for hosting. For yeah. hosting, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this will only extend the problem. This is not a uh, solution. But for the, the seven months that you've been here, obviously you've become very aware that we had a housing shortage and that housing was very expensive here anyway. Mm. Um, do you think that there's anything that really could have been done differently by the government, knowing that there was already a shortage of accommodation, wanting to try and do the best thing possible for people like you fleeing a war, but not having a, a ready-made stock of accommodation to put you in? Uh, they can only extend our living here. And I think uh, the issue could be they can provide some barracks or housing like for mm. short term. Would Spain. that be? Would that still be preferable? Maybe to Maybe because a lot of other Germany, options? Germany does the same. And actually, uh, I know about the situation is Germ in Germany. They provided the type of housing several years ago, but there are so many people staying there for years and years. And then local government would say, uh, "You're no, you're no longer able to stay here. We're no longer interested." What has happened Come in those back. cases? They just expect people to go. They home? have to travel home. They go home. Yeah, yeah. They have something like blue card or something like a permanent stay residence. And instead of that, they can even leave. They can even work. And somehow government shall shall say you, mm, you're no longer needed here. I mean, we've seen, you know, temporary accommodation right across Europe, even particularly at border crossings. Um, I was at Medica at the time in Poland when the war first broke out. And, you know, some of those setups people will understand are fine for, like an, as you said, a night or two kind of a temporary basis. But do you think it's time and you kind of alluded to it there already that, you know, Ireland be more transparent with people who are coming now about what actually is on offer? And and do you see that transparency taking place? I suppose maybe you don't keep an eye on the, the forums as much as you did when you were travelling, uh, but do you see that transparency happening now? No, 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 no. No one, no one covers this issue over the media. No one. Okay. Only, only. But you see local uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainians don't uh, monitor like um, Irish media. Yeah. They don't. Uh, because they why don't would search. they? Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah they why don't would search they? for housing problems and all of that. Mm. They were told there would be 
um, some um, good conditions of living provided, mm. and they're waiting to settle down. I think, at least for several years. Mm. But it's impossible. What's the atmosphere like amongst Ukrainians who are here now? Then, I mean, if if they have that sort of view and they see the situation with regards to accommodation, they see that the atmosphere, as you say, has sort of changed to some degree. What are Ukrainians at the moment talking about in Ireland? Uh, they don't know what to do. Yeah. Because the country itself is amazing. People are amazing. I think the most reason of their staying is uh, are, are people. People. Mm. So the people are great and the country yeah, isn't. Yeah, it's a treasure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for your nice Thank words you. about the people at least. But um, it must be very difficult to try and get your head around the idea that, that the people are great, but that the government or that society just isn't as equipped to accommodate you as you might have been told. Yes, but we are foreigners and there is nothing we can do. We can argue because we are not locals. We don't have uh, any rights to argue with government. That's it. We can't strike. What What shall we do? We can only say mm, it's a pity. Mm. Alina, one more question for you. I mean, when you look at your country's future, and obviously we're in a situation where nobody knows how long this is going to go on for, but I think everybody around the world has been inspired by what Ukrainian people, how they've pulled together, how they have, you know, endured and showed such resiliency at a hor horrendous time, the worst possible thing that can happen effectively to a country. What do you think the future is for Ukrainians and for Ukraine as a country? When, well, if we are talking about my humble opinion, I think that Ukraine is no longer the same country and most likely uh, not in the same borders. We, we don't know if NATO would be engaged into the conflict. If they're engaged, there would be a huge war. Yeah. If no, anyways, Ukraine would be split between different countries. Who knows? No one. Okay. Or it would be extended conflict for years and years, like five, ten years. Anything can happen. Ukraine uh, somehow is a great country, but absolutely unpredictable. Yeah. It's a horrible situation to be in. But Lena, thank you so much for, for coming in and trying to put into words a lot of what we talk about in the abstract, you know, and about when we talk about accommodation, when we talk about Ukraine and the situation. Thanks so much for coming in and telling thank us first hand. No, and Alina, can us. I just say, I think our country is all the more richer for having people like you. So thank you for choosing Ireland and thank you thank for you. being here. Thank you too. Thank you to guys because of welcoming. It's really appreciated.